Hi, everybody. It's uh, Kevin Raber, and we're back for another photo chats. And this is going to be a real exciting and fun uh, photo chats today. Um, we took last week off or last uh, the photo chats off and um, still lining up some speakers. We do have a confirmed speaker now for the uh, 23rd of October for the next one. Uh, well, we have October 9th, too. Um, but um, uh, Drew Hendricks from Red River Paper will be joining us talking about uh, photography, his uh, paper lines, why he's uh, cutting and, and selling traditional size paper like 8x10s and 5x7s and 11x14s and, you know, his commitment to the photographer and, and, and printing. And of course, all of you know that um, I'm a big junkie when it comes to printing, uh, at least on the digital side. My darkroom days are over and I certainly miss those days, but uh, the print is the most important thing. I think it's still is the representation of what a photograph is and when you have that in your hands you've accomplished the mission so um we do have a fine art printing workshop coming up here in two weeks uh jeff's going to be part of that and we, we got a full house for that one so it's going to be really fun to uh to spend the weekend making a lot of prints so the, we have five of those that have been announced for next year if you go to rockhopperworkshops.com uh you can take a look at the dates for those five workshops and uh Come down to Indianapolis and join us. We have um, even a guest from Australia coming for this class, so it's going to be quite fun. Anyway, we're very, very privileged today, uh, and all of you, I really appreciate you coming out to have an amazing guest, um, uh, Kim Weston. And of course, we all know, you know, there's just not one Weston, there's a whole load of Westons, and um, uh, every one of them's got their own story, and uh, we're going to hear about all those stories. and. Um, I don't know what more to say other than uh, Kim does a lot of beautiful photographs of, of women, and um, it's quite unique. And uh, of course, we know his, what his family has done, and his brothers, and his fathers, and every, you know, it's just it's the Westons. What are you going to say? So, without really going much further, um, I'm going to say hi, Kim. Thanks for coming by, and. What we'll do here in a second is I'm going to mute everybody's microphones uh, for all the speakers that are speaking. Uh, you'll have to maybe unmute your microphones and we'll do this presentation. And at the very end, you can unmute your microphone if you have an act, uh, a question. Now, there is a chat box. And if you have questions during the presentation, uh, please put your questions in the chat box. That'll be being monitored by John. And um, John will then break in where he has to or save those questions for the end when we have a question and answer period. Joining me today is John Cornicello and Jeff Shiwi, uh, partners in crime for the Photo PXLs, and um, Holger Mischke, who is also part of our little four-man group, is um, vacationing and uh, unable to connect uh, over on the European side of things. So um, we'll see him again next time. And, as always, I really do want to put out a big grand appreciation for what uh, John has done in the past. During the pandemic, John did two of these a week. I don't know how he did it. And um, it was a, a great way for us to get together uh, twice a week and, and talk about photography and learn about photography. And then it kind of faded away as we came out of the pandemic and um, Holger and Jeff and John and I decided, well, you know, let's see if we can bring it back and uh, have some fun with it. It's a lot more difficult getting speakers because everybody's out doing their photography thing, but um, we do have quite a list of good speakers that have committed to uh, speaking. We just haven't seen them commit to the dates yet, so um, we'll keep on top of that. And uh, you can always find those, that information over at Photo PXL um, and the links and whatnot for, for doing it. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to John and Kim and uh, John, uh, Jeff and I, and uh, let's do this, nope. this talk. So I'm going to mute everybody. So please just hang on a second while I do that. And I remember anybody that I mute, especially speakers, make sure you're unmuted before you speak. And everybody is now muted. Okay. Okay. And quickly, um, Kevin, what was your printing workshop company? It's um, it's it's a fine art printing workshop at rockhopperworkshops.com. Okay, that was in the box, but <clears throat> let's introduce Kim here. Uh, we're here to talk about his new book here, Growing Up Weston, which I have a copy here if I can lift it. It's pretty hefty here. Was it 348 pages? 
Yeah, that's a pretty good size. <laughs> good size book. You've been working on this for a while, it seems. Six years, six years. Wow. <laughs> six years and how many generations? Uh, four generations in the book. <laughs> And it's not just photos. It's a lot of text, too, about your life and growing up and being you. Um, yeah, I get that question a lot from people that, that have looked at the book so far. They they were surprised that there was a lot of text. And I said, well, most of my photography comes from experiences in, in life. So the text sort of fills in the, the spots uh, and sort of explains my sort of path that I'm going on in photography. And it just, to me, I just didn't want another picture book uh, because so much of my work is is cerebral about my ideas and stuff. So the writing to me was very important. And everyone in, in the family has done things differently. I mean, your stuff is mostly studio based, it seems like. I mean, you've done a lot of location stuff too, but you've built a lot of sets over the years which is different than your predecessors. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when I started photographing, of course, I would go out with my, <clears throat> excuse me, my dad and my uncle, and we'd pile in the car and go on the east side of Sierra, Sierra 395, and I'd photograph, you know, Western stuff, rocks and trees and mud cracks. <laughs> and, and I did that for quite a while. Uh, you know, basically, I started photography when I was six, but... Um, and I finally got to a point where that wasn't satisfied enough in what I was getting. I wanted more involvement. And so I, I went to shooting uh, my friends' nudes, of course, in my house in Carmel at the time, and built a studio. And that's when I started building sets. And I wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, everything in the photograph to be something that I had control over. Um, and so the set building, you know, I was in construction for 30 years. So set building was kind of fun, you know, because it's not real. You know, it's it's sort of like movie sets. And uh, yeah, it just was a process that um, I enjoyed working with, with another human being. Um, and that interaction with another person, uh, excuse me, was real important for me. Because then it's... Yeah. it's <clears throat> Yeah, it's a, it's a, and John, you know this from shooting people. It's a collaboration between two people, and yeah. it's not just going out and and finding something. You know, I wanted to make everything, so that's why I ended up in the studio and was in the studio pretty much for thirty years. Yeah, on page ninety four, you bring up something that I often think about: if it was, is it a process or a product of photography? And it's, for this, there's a lot of process there, but it's also an important product. So for you, it's really both. Yeah, absolutely. The set building. So, you know, I could work at any time. You know, photography is so light driven, but I could build the sets, paint the sets 24-7. You know, I wasn't a slave to the light outside. So I was constantly being able to work. So the actual photograph was a, was a, a sort of, record of that process especially mm -hmm. when you're building sets and and painting them and and uh, uh i i love that sort of that whole thing of spending time with the photograph not just like landscape photography it's it's a matter of seconds to get that image that you need uh i could spend days painting and building and 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 then eventually photographing the set Right, so let's see. I, I think I first met you 2007. Ted Proust, who's here in the room, uh, brought me to visit you around Thanksgiving that year. Uh, uh -huh. And I've been back eight times since to, to Carmel. Uh, as I was saying before we started this, there's something special, magic about the light and about the location and the light, because the photos I made there are totally different than anything I've made anywhere else. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Do you have a feeling about that? I mean, you've lived there, so I don't. Know. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. You know, growing up, uh, you know, of course, my grandfather died when when I was five years old, so I never really met him. I only met him once here, at Wildcat, but it, and sitting at the table that that we sit at today, 
uh, is where I, I saw him because he was quite old and had, you know, Parkinson's at that time. Um, but it's pretty ironic to think that I eventually ended up sitting at that same table, you know, uh, 30, 40 years later, you know, it's, uh, it's a sort of a big circle, you know. So what got you started on the idea for this book, Growing Up Weston? Um, I was visiting a friend in New York, uh, George Holtz, and he had just finished a book called Holtz's Hollywood. Um, he's a celebrity photographer, but also a fine art photographer. And I just, I thought, I saw his book and I thought, this is so cool. And I decided, well, you know, I need to make a book. And the thing is, it went through many, <clears throat> excuse me, many changes as we went along. Um, and, you know, it's a long process and, and how the book ended up the way it is now, influenced by a lot of people that helped me on the book. You know, the first one was Brian Blowski. And in the beginning, I wanted this sort of really edgy, you know, because my work is kind of edgy. Uh, there was a book uh, Hunter S. Thompson did called Gonzo. And it was sort of fast paced book, you know, not like a photography book at all. And I started in that vein and eventually uh, just through different people helping us, uh, it sort of changed and morphed into more of uh, what you see today, which is uh, <laughs> which is sort of a history of, of my family and how I fit in that history. Yeah, some of the interesting things there I learned about you is you get a lot of time sailing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I knew about your background in construction, but this going out to the Galapagos and out further than that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's I spent uh, I sailed probably over forty thousand miles on our sailboat. Um, we had it for thirty years, and I started when I was sixteen. Uh, a great experience. I didn't do a lot of photography, um, but you know we went to Tahiti. I was left Monterey on the boat and didn't come back for three years so spent a, uh, like you said the Galapagos Islands uh, on our way to Tahiti and spent a year in Tahiti uh, so yeah it was quite an adventure <laughs> you know and who's that coming up behind you there that's, that's my <laughs> lovely wife she's <laughs> zooming by who who was a huge part of the book uh, yes she's on the cover yeah yeah <laughs> I'll hold that up again for people if you if yeah. I talk it up to you, you pop me onto the screen again. No. Yeah. You can you can order that book from um Kim's website. Well, Kim Kim's website. I think you have two editions, but, right? Uh, it's not showing me in speaking. Yeah. Why is it not, not popping over to me? Yeah, it's showing you now. Is it talk? Yeah. You know? Yeah. There you okay. go. But I want to make sure people got to see it there. Yeah, there's two versions. That's the trade of trade version, and then mm -hmm. there's a special edition which has uh, exactly the same book, different cover, and comes with two prints in a, a clamshell box. Uh, you think well, that- i got to tell you, Kim, uh, this is Jeff Shiwi. I, uh, uh, I, got, I got the limited edition, and I'm thinking about to actually have both an Edward Weston and a Kim Weston print. Uh, Gina and I were going back and forth. The problem is, I don't know whether to frame it or just keep it in- you know, the, in the homage box. of the book and the time show case. Uh, yeah. But I got to tell you, the, the book itself was wonderful, but the, that presentation of the limited edition was, was um, uh, I thought, very tasteful and and yeah. uh, uh, very well packaged, too, by the way. I'm keeping the darn box. Right. I, I know. <laughs> e even the shipping box is pretty amazing. Yeah, that's what I'm keeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, the We had it done... Um, in China, it was the only, I tried to do it in the United States, but uh, the price here was just way, way out of bounds. And so China was the only place that, that uh, we could print it. And they do such a wonderful job of packaging. China is famous for that. So um, yeah, very happy with that. And there's only uh, 26, uh, I did a hundred special editions and there's only 26 uh, left. That's great. 
That, that's a, that's a shame about the American side of things. I mean, they get great printers, but they are very expensive. And I know a lot of people that have made books similar to yours that have gone to China to have them done. Um, oh yeah, and and the quality is excellent. It's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, that was the one thing I was kind of worried about um, was the quality and and. The, the, the designer that we eventually went with, and we pretty much, Gina and I and, and uh, Birgit, uh, put the book together, but we really needed someone to to zero in on. They didn't change it that much, but having a professional um, um, do the final adjusting was really important. Birgit's and our, in the room, too, if she wants to make any comments about things. Yeah, and Artron... Who is Birgit? Uh, is that what he said? Yeah, Artron uh, up in uh, up in the Bay Area. They did they did the the printing. They they had the contact with the China office. That's something so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking. Process? Sorry, say it again, John. I think I talked over you. I was asking Birgit if she had any comments on the process of working on this book. <clears throat> oh, well, it was amazing. A lot of uh, uh, Kim's food afterwards. So I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> well, that's another thing we didn't, we didn't bring up yet. Kim is a great cook, too. That was part of the going to the workshops. There was getting well, food. there's a recipe in the book. <laughs> yeah. Too, so, uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was amazing an amazing experience to work on it. And I got to know Kim a whole lot more, not only just being over there a lot, but you know, through the process of, of him basically writing down what, how he works. I was amazed. I, I Half the stuff um, that he told me, I didn't, I had no idea. So it, it was, it's, it's a great book. It's really not just for, um, you know, to, to look at the images, but the, his process, he just lays it all out. I mean, he's from like, uh, growing calla lilies from seed to take one of these pictures to, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, it, it, I really like it a lot. It's, uh, it's definitely something people should buy and, and, uh, and have to, uh, to learn, to learn from him, to learn how, he goes about things. It's 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 that you don't get from another photography book. You know, you look at pictures, you, you read a little bio, but he puts it all out there. Well, so, Bridget, can, awesome. can I ask what what exactly do you do? So we, we understand how you played in a part in this book. I'm a graphic designer by trade, <clears throat> and I took the design that uh, they had, and basically, I arranged the all the text into sections because it, it was it was just written you know in a string and so i made sections i made uh the um the double spread collages he mm -hmm. had, had all these pictures of his family color this size that size and they had it put put together in a, in a weird way and i tried to find a way to um <clears throat> show it in a, in a in a nice way so i had his i had him put his hands out and uh hold one of the pictures and my daughter took a, a photo of the whole table covered in photos oh, let me just cool. see if i can get myself onto the screen again there yeah, yeah. i think yeah. that so worked out time. well for so you, it doesn't look like uh what do you call those books you know where you glue with your pictures in like a scratch book or a yeah, so it, it, it worked out really well. I, I liked uh, that was a problem page. And as anything, you make something out of a a problem becomes a feature, you know, when you find a solution <laughs> for it. Great. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Couldn't have done it without her. How did you uh, to end up meeting them? Through my daughter. Uh, my daughter's a photographer and she did workshops with uh, Kim down in Big Sur. And you know we live in the same community. We I live in on the Monterey Peninsula. We are we go to the same um, events. We have the common friends like we're Yuji or Roman. So 
we all hang out and at each other's houses and it's, it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's very cool. So do you do this all the time? And if you do, uh, maybe you uh, go over to the chat and leave a link to how somebody can contact you. Cause I know I, I work on a number of books and um, Brooks Jensen will be here. And part of what we're talking about is the creation of books. Who knows books better than Brooks? And yeah, um, I'm actually uh, putting out a book myself at the moment with a clamshell and, and print. So I have that done here in Germany. I have done a prototype right now. Right. So yeah, I'll put a, I'll put a, a link in, the, in a chat. In the link. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Cool. It's cool how you yeah. hooked up. It's a small <laughs> world, isn't it? When you think about it, you know, it is really small. She got me a, a pinhole camera, which oh, to wow. me, was, and she, she does beautiful <laughs> pinhole work. So we actually worked together on a couple of projects that uh, that she wanted. Um, but that's a whole other story, the pinhole. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about Kim. But uh, it's yeah. it's it was a, a truly I was so enthusiastic about about his book and uh, it was fun working on it uh, for sure. So excellent. Yeah, I'm going to ask someone to put a link to the book in the chat. I don't have a browser window open to do that right now myself. Um, I'll see if I can do it. I have his uh, web page right up here, so I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. So, Kim, is all your work black and white? <clears throat> yes, all the work is black and white, except for uh, the work that I paint on. Paint uh, on I paint yes. on the black and white. Yeah. How so, did you get started in painting on your photographs? Well, it happened. A friend of mine, uh, Reed Farrington, who's passed away, uh, is a painter, and I've known him ever since I was very young, and. We did a collaboration once where I gave him photographs and then he painted on them. And it was a really wonderful exchange because uh, he didn't ask, you know, I want that photograph or this photograph. I just gave him the photographs and then I didn't I didn't uh, tell him how to paint it. So we had a show and it was actually quite successful. And um, I've always was inspired by painters. Most of my ideas come from from painters and so i ended up with ryuji uh, working on platinum prints um and he taught me that process but in doing that i ended up with a bunch of platinum small uh four by five platinums that i couldn't they weren't good enough but i was too cheap to throw them away <laughs> so they kept on piling up and I was looking at them and said, oh, you know, I think I'll start coloring these. And uh, of course, it was platinum paper, so uh, it really didn't take uh, uh, oil paint very well. So I used a lot of crayons and uh, charcoal and stuff like that. And I really, I really enjoyed it. You know, it was to me never being taught as a painter um, to be able to start something and have the possibility of, you know, I'm a good photographer. I've done it my whole life. I wanted a challenge that I could fail at because without having that challenge, without that possibility of failure, I don't mm. think you can have success. So there was that, that not fear, but that sort of excitement about uh, painting and then showing, showing it, you know, it's like showing your first photograph. Yeah, I'm gonna share some here if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Is that showing now for you? Yeah, but everything else is showing too. I, I think you got the screensaver, your desktop. Okay, me, I hit the wrong one. Let me try that again. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's right. Oh, nice desktop. <laughs> it's not a big bird. <laughs> yeah. It now? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. And eventually I... I I moved to uh, painting on regular silver gelatin prints. Uh, and to me, I'm such a storyteller in my work that it was like like having uh, another... Uh, I'm getting some feed. Yeah, we got, everybody, please check your mics if you just signed on and make yourself muted, please. Um, Kim, are, are these like... Uh, images that you've painted on or are we looking at images a combination how maybe you could do no, a little background of each yeah what they're straight images. yeah they're a straight black and white photograph just like i would hang up on the wall right and then i i paint over that onto them um 
So, and it's interesting because photography is very image driven. It's all about the image where with painting, it's just the opposite. Painting is, is about the application of paint. So this image we're seeing on the screen right now, I can paint it a hundred different ways. It's the same image, but the paint changes the, the concept of the image. Uh, I really like that, that sort of feeling. And plus it's, they're one of a kind. So they're yeah. all unique in that, in that sense. Show us more, John. <laughs> they're pretty cool. <laughs> sure. Let's, here, I can go back and. Elka's there at the gallery. Yeah. And um, Elka's Fine Art Gallery in uh, uh, Columbus, they handle all my painted uh, work. Um, I'm just going to pick some random photos here that I have to share. And Kim, you can talk about them. Did I do it right this time? Yeah, I see a yeah. whole bunch of them. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah. Uh, this is actually the cover of the special edition book. Um, and this is more sort of straight design and function of a person and model. This is a great friend of mine who is a model for me. That's another thing I love about working um, with a model is that relationship that you get with that person. And each model is different, each model, mm -hmm. you know. And that's why in the book, I had four of my main models actually write uh, about working with me, which I thought was really important instead of, having just, you know, the figure, I wanted the models to explain what it was like working. So that's kind of unique. I haven't seen anyone do that. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, so the- Especially I know a few of them too. It was like good to hear from them in there, like Jennifer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, this was, this one here was in uh, Spain. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, the work that I'm doing now is a little different. Um, this is Scotland. This is a uh, 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 workshop that we did uh, over with, with Martin. <laughs> I was there. He was on, online here somewhere. Um, but yes, uh, what happened was after building sets for so many years, uh, we started doing workshops uh, and I would look for places that the sets were already built. Um, so, uh, but, you know, a photograph like this is, is more about just light and design. Um, mm -hmm. I notice a lot of your images don't include faces. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the face to me was sort of, it plays a definite role in the photograph, mm -hmm. but it changes the concept of, of the photograph. Um, this is in Barcelona, uh, this on top of the Gaudi building. That in, in, in itself was an adventure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't, uh, I, my friend Miguel uh, arranged the workshop, and I don't think the people at the Gaudi building knew that we were doing nudes. And so we were on top of the very top of the building. It's an absolutely gorgeous building. And someone across the way saw us and they call the, and if you know the Gaudi buildings, they're, they're national treasures. I mean, they're just it's one of Spain's most important architects. And um, they said they're doing, they're shooting porno on top of the uh, Gaudi building. <laughs> we barely got out of there. I mean, the cops were coming in we were going out the other door. All oh, hell broke loose. Uh, there was this big thing about we couldn't show the photographs and, you know, went on and on. And of course, when I got back to the States, like they weren't going to come after me there, but um, yeah, it was, it was uh, quite an adventure. Hey, there you are. Can, can, can I ask something, um, Kim? Uh, yeah. The picture you took on the, uh, the stairway in Spain, kind of a really cool picture, but it looks like it might have been a progression of things. So um, during a photograph like that, uh, are you doing a whole series and you just pick the best of the series or are you really preconceiving 
uh, a pose that of what we're like what we're looking at here. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You find a location like this, and of course, this is a place I'd never been before. So it's a different type of process. It, you have to be relatively quick. We weren't staying there a long time. It was in an architect's house. And so instantly I saw the design of the stairs. And you notice only in Spain, they would not have a, a handrail. You know, the handrail is on the wall, not on the outside. So I just saw all these lines. So, and it's hard to see in this picture, but she's actually dropping a hat. That's that's larva. Um, so okay. we did we did a whole yeah right there we did a a whole series at, at this these steps because the lighting was just absolutely incredible. Um, and of course, I'm working with students at that time, and so it was really interesting to see the work they came away with exactly the same setup. Uh, but yeah, it's it it is a process. Um, I had the model, this is larva, like I said, uh, under the stairs with the lines going through her. So you you work relatively quickly in this in this situation. And there again, you know, the clouds are real important, but you can't always, that's the one thing about shooting outside, you can't always uh, have what you want. So that's what I loved about the studio. If I wanted clouds, I'd paint them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Now, is this what so the other Kim, one being? Yeah, Kim, I was going to ask you, uh, for the techies among us, uh, you're still pretty much analog and shooting film, is that correct? Yeah, I shoot uh, nothing but film. Yeah. And uh, uh, the thing is, are you primarily uh, you camera or are you wolf film? No. Uh, originally, of course, I was 8 by 10 uh, pretty yeah. much exclusively. Uh, but as, as things sort of changed and I moved out of the studio, um, I wanted a, a, a camera that was a little quicker and more, more mobile. So my dad had passed away and he had left me his RB67. And I was always kind of leery, <laughs> excuse me, because I'm so used to that big negative that I, that, and I like to enlarge my work. So... I was kind of leery, you know, how can I, you know, will this film work this six by seven, uh, blowing it up and still have, you know, the quality I want. And I found it it works great with the modern films. And um, and it's it's interesting when we were in China, uh, Roman and I, and they were doing this uh, film on me for the local TV. And so we're all at this they brought, they got a model. Of course, the model wasn't new, but uh, we worked at a, a, a train station. And I went in, opened up the back of the car, and got my camera out. And they go, oh, Mr. Wesson, your camera's so old. Why do you have old camera? <laughs> you know? It was just hilarious because they thought, why? You know, and it is. It's probably 40, 40 years old. And... Um, yeah, I sort of laughed at that, you know, because uh, in, in China, they're very sort of uh, modern, you know, and they have the newest equipment and everything. So uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, very old camera. <laughs> I said, there it is, works. There it's is, light tight. There is, <laughs> there is something that's actually happening is a, kind of a reversion to analog for the authenticity of the image. A digital camera, or whether it's AI manipulated or AI generated, the nice thing about uh, a piece of film, you can show the film as the authentic um, uh, original. And uh, that's something that I think uh, uh, a lot of the Gen Z uh, young kids are starting to look at that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, our son does the Western Collective and he teaches. Uh, third and fourth graders, uh, second graders, analog photography and uh, also digital. But he sort of keeps the analog separate. He, uh, digital is nice when they're really young because it's very simple. Uh, and But they all want to go to analog later on. And, and, and Zach sort of has that as a carrot, you know, to... They say, oh, you know, Mr. Rustin, we want to go to darkroom work, you know, which is kind of sweet. 
Um, you know, I don't, when digital came out, uh, of course it's advanced so far now, uh, the quality of it. I, you know, I don't care how the picture's taken. It doesn't matter to me. When I see it up on the wall, um, I've seen an uh, awful lot of really bad analog photography <laughs> and a <laughs> lot of bad digital photography. Uh, they're just tools. They're tools to to uh, express yourself with. So I, I have no aversion towards uh, digital at all. You know, it's just I, there's no reason for me to change. You know, I can accomplish everything with my process. Uh, there again, really simple. You know, I, I've been doing the same thing since I was six years old. Well, it's interesting when I met Jerry Olsman, uh, he uh, that he did a project at one time for Adobe, uh, where uh, George, I think George Jardine put uh, a couple of his images together in Photoshop, and and you know the what do you think about that? And he liked his process, so he kept using his six or seven enlargers yeah. and and actually took the same film that he had used for the the poster project and redid it in the darkroom. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say is that you have been a great steward of the Weston name and also Wildcat Hill. I've had the um, um, uh, uh, great honor to actually come and, and visit you. You have the work on the wall behind you. You have a collection of your grandfather's, uh, your uncle's and your father's work and your work. And now Zach Excellent. is part yeah. of the Weston Collective. So talk to us briefly about what the Weston Collective really is all about. Well, it started, actually, Gina and I started it. Um, Gina had taken a class because, you know, we'd gotten together and she was my model uh, in the beginning. And and she was also running the computer and contacting people. And she didn't know a lot about photography. So she took a course from MPC, our local college, and because she wanted to know what F stop means, you know, <laughs> people asked her. So, and she was really surprised that, you know, here we are in, in the West Coast, you know, which is a, a center of West Coast photography and Ansel and my grandfather and, you know, a whole number of photographers. And they were rationing out paper. They were rationing out paper towels and then some of the places were getting rid of, of their uh, their analog uh, dark rooms. And so we decided that, you know, we didn't want that to happen, especially in the high school level. So we started this, um, this sort of uh, contest to, to get people to, to put, uh, put in prints. Uh, local students and stuff, and we gave off awards. And it just grew and grew. And, um, you know, uh, I think now that now Zach's been running it for quite a few years, we've given over, you know, $150,000 in scholarships out. Uh, yeah, and we do all the fundraising ourselves uh, here at Wildcat. Um, so, yeah, he's he's really stepped it up a notch, and we have a place – over in Seaside, uh, where he, he runs a collective. So, um, yeah, it's 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 great to see how he's brought it uh, to a new level. It's really amazing. Let me ask: Is there anyone in the audience that has some questions for Kim that would like to ask him now? Just unmute yourself and ask, or raise your hand. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, John. Uh -oh. Kim. Yes. At what point did you go from just being a photographer to doing all these workshops, doing, you know, the nonprofit? How did that all come to be? Well, John, it really started because uh, I would do workshops with my dad and uh, we'd do them down at Garapata, which is the property we have there. And he had his dark room there. And so I was always assisting him in, in his, his workshops. So that was, it was a way uh, he was getting old at that time, and it was a way that I could help him, even though I'd, I'd worked for him for many years, uh, working on um, the EW uh, negatives, uh, printing for books and stuff like that. So, uh, and eventually, uh, I didn't, I didn't, 
I didn't want to change my work for it to sell. Uh, and I still don't. Uh, I do it for myself. And I knew I was going to have to do something. I didn't want to do construction anymore. And I came to Gina and said, I'm going to quit construction. Let's just focus, you know, on uh, the photography end of it. And I knew I'd have to teach. Um I just, my work is so much different when you think of West and you don't, you don't see my type of work. Um, and so I started teaching and, uh, you know, even with a great last name, I could not make a living off of selling my work. Uh, and, and, you know, it just, uh, I wasn't going to compromise uh, to make my work sell, you know, I, I do it for myself. So it was a gradual pro progression of, uh, because the carpentry, you know, the construction paid for everything. And I, I would I would uh, get up at three in the morning, like my uncle Brett and Fran, and then go off to work on the, the construction site where we built homes and I'd photograph on the weekends. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it was an evolution from from quitting uh, construction to working full time, uh, even though I was always working in photography, but to to really sort of narrow it down to just that. Thanks. That sounds like a Harrison Ford story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> that's pretty cool. Yeah. Anybody else with some questions? Jim Brachier posted something in the <clears throat> chat here. Let me see if I can find it here. Given the range of what analog film analog film can mean, does it make sense to put all of it in the same metaphorical box? Analog is his 1972 OM1 film, medium format and large format, and so many other cameras with different photographic experiences. Could you lump all the digital into the same box? But analog, maybe not so much. Um, Jim, do you want to clarify a little more on what you're saying there? Well, it's just Kim was talking about this wonderful old camera that he has, and it's a film camera, but it's very distinct from my from this camera. And yet we say, "Oh, it's all analog because it's not digital." And I think what's interesting is that I think it's easier to put all digital cameras into the same box because. They do differ, the lenses differ, but the range of difference between Kim's camera and my camera is profound. And there's a very different photographic experience and creation. Um, if somebody has the, you know, any of the other range of, of analog cameras, they're distinct. With Okay, now I think I understand what you're saying, because now that I'm thinking about it, when I was shooting 8x10 and 4x5, there was a certain process to it. When you go to the RB, it's the big kerchunk and the multiple cranks on it. And then the 35, the low M1 is almost silent and it's very different both for the photographer and for the subject. Very much. It, both my cameras, the, 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 the pen, big Pentax and the Mamiya, when you fire that, <laughs> you yeah, can Pentax hear it. Six by seven. Yeah. Kim, is that a six by seven Pentax? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But um, it was interesting. I wanted to do a sort of intimate uh, photo session of my, of my models uh, who were staying here at Wildcat up in Bodie House and asked them if I could, because I that process of them getting ready to model, you know, normally they come out and they're done. They're made up. They're, they're, they're professionals. But I wanted to, to photograph them in that process of waking up of going to the the bathroom and putting on the makeup, that whole sort of process was fascinating to me. And I asked them, and they said, "Sure." I went up with my uh, my uh, Mamiya, and the first one that I <laughs> fired off, they just they jumped. You know, it made so much noise. I I said I can't do it. You know, because I went back the next day and I got my original. Uh, Roloflex, which was one of the first, it was the first camera my dad gave me when I was six. And it, the shutter is absolutely silent on it. Really? Mm -hmm. And went and redid it. And uh, it worked out great. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but I think they're well, all they're basically tools. Thirty five millimeter, you know, has a place and and you know for sports, for street photography, it's quick, it's fast, it's light. Um, you know, it's just like the uh digital cameras. There are all types of different digital cameras, and the little teeny ones to uh you know, the big fancy ones. Uh so yeah, there's definite range of cameras. Each one is sort of suited for a certain thing. When I switch from the 8x10 to the uh, Mamiya, even though I still shoot the Mamiya on a tripod, it was like, I call it a camera with wings because it was so light and so quick. And I could go around the models, you know, uh, where the 8x10 is a big tripod. And, you know, I was fighting it all the time. <clears throat> so I, the... Yeah, the, it, and I just adapted to it. You know, it just it's it's my go to camera now. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, Sam Abel, Tim, do you know Sam Abel? Yeah, uh, National Geo, long time. Yeah, uh, he loves the the uh, composing weight and micro composition, which uh, you know John and I both from being studio photographers are accustomed to that setting up a camera, framing that working within the frame moving stuff around inside of the frame moving the camera around but it's it's pretty much locked in uh and uh when he was shooting at national geographic all of his other photographer friends would make fun of him because he would set his little 35 millimeter camera up on a big tripod at, and do the same thing that we would do with a view camera so that's the way you shoot with uh the six by seven right yeah, no, absolutely. That hasn't that hasn't changed. Uh, you're, and the, the six by seven is basically the same visual as an eight by ten, the same dimensions, almost exactly. Um, but speaking of uh, National Geographic, when we were on our boat in in Bermuda, uh, they were doing a story on uh, Teddy Tucker, who was a famous uh, uh, treasure diver. So I, I met the guy that was shooting for National Geographic, I forget his name, but um, I asked him, how, how is it working for National Geographic? I mean, uh, he said, what they want, what the editors want, they want five pounds of film a day. He had to shoot that many 35 millimeter rolls, five pounds worth a day and send it back to, to the main office. And I thought, wow, that's already five pounds of film. But that's what they're, you know, that's what his uh, quota was on how much how much they wanted to look at. You know, um, that's another thing with digital. I think uh, unless you've done analog, I think if you just go straight to digital and and ever gone through the process of the analog system where you're you know you're shooting your film, you're developing it. There's a whole rhythm to it. Um, I see a lot of people at our workshops, probably 98% of them are digital. Uh, they shoot just way too much. You know, it, it, the camera can do it. You know, it just, it just sits there and you can fire away at it. And that's the one thing that sort of distresses me is, is those bad habits that, that people learn from um, having the ability to shoot hundreds and hundreds of, of images uh, to me, that's that's not really photography, at least in, in my sense. Uh, uh, you know, I always tell people, I said, why are you taking this photograph? And that usually stumps them because <laughs> they don't know, you know. And I've always pretty much known why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I find I come back with fewer images than I thought I took, even if yeah. I use them to drive for something. So I'm still thinking of film, I think, in my head. You know, yeah. At the end of that scene, and I only have two when I get back. It's like, oh, right. I keep in the button. So no, it's, it's, it's true. Fun. I I can see people that take our workshops that have trained in in analog. They don't shoot as much, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> digital. But it's interesting. Also, uh, my good friend Hunter Witherall, uh, mm -hmm. great uh, analog black and white photographer for years. Uh, switched over to digital and instead of just copying what he did 
uh, in his black and white analog period, he used that tool in a whole new way of, of expressing himself. Um, he wasn't just trying to replicate, you know, here he had this new concept and he did these incredible, uh, which you can only do with digital, with Photoshop, uh, flower series where he manipulated everything and just a whole new vision that opened up for him artistically. Uh, he wasn't just replacing his old old style. Uh, he was using the digital process as a real uh, artistic movement forward. It was really, really interesting. A um, couple of questions. Kim, a question just popped up here um, from a John Weaver, and he'd like you to talk a little bit about working with models and breaking their posing flow. Um, well, it's so funny because I always liked using the same models because you build a relationship with them. And like I said earlier, they're all uniquely different. And the interaction between me and each model um, is different. And that's why that connection the two of us have together, we're, you know, it's not just I'm posing them and making art, we're working together. And especially a, a lot of my, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of my photographs are inspired by painters. I mean, Balthus is one of my favorite. Uh, Degas is another favorite. So I have these visions in my head of these paintings and I'll actually go to the model and say, hey, you know, let's work on this together and see what we can do. Not that we're trying to copy it, but it's a feeling that I want to get across. Um, and so to me, it's a collaboration that we're working as a team. And I like that. I like that um, that sense of, of uh, connection with the two of us together as working as one. You know, yeah, I may come up with a photograph, but they're just as much a part of that as I am. And there are different ways of shooting when you talk about flow. Um, sometimes, and there again, the personality of the model is is real important. Some of them like to move, uh, you know, constantly. Others are much more static. So you adapt to that that their their personalities. Um, Sometimes you'll get in a rhythm and, and photographing with, and that's why the connection is so important, knowing the person um, and discovering together. It's, it's like a, it's like an adventure together. And that's why, you know, using the same models again and again, gives me that opportunity to have that relationship. I mean, I can photograph, models that I'd never met before. It's a, it's a little bit of a different process, but uh, I'm much more comfortable uh, collaborating together. Yeah, I see the uh, reference to Degas, especially in some of the ballerina and the painting that you did of the ballerinas. Yes, yes. And if you look at their, their work, his work is very <clears throat> photographic. Um, that period that sort of shifted from you know, um, and he actually, he he did photograph, but like cutting off uh, tables, cut, you know, arranging, it's it's filling that rectangle in a, in a, a pleasing way. And a lot of those painters, Balthus is another one um, that that manipulates that frame to to work on, you know, that space and make that space work. Uh, yeah, it's, and then of course I did a whole series, ballet series, uh, which was fun. Uh, started off with, with my normal models. He, originally I never paid, you know, I didn't use professional models, I used friends. And mm -hmm. so, you know, my wife and her girlfriends. And so I wanted to do this, this, a series of ballerinas and it didn't come off too well with the regular first i didn't have the equipment the right tutus you know i went online and bought these funny little things and and i got some work but there again it's not you never sort of finish a project so then gina got professional 
uh, dancers for me. And that changed uh, uh, how, you know, it got more to what I wanted. And then I got these uh, nut nutcracker sweet uh, young uh, models, um, not models, ballerinas. And they had the beautiful uh, tutus and stuff. And it was interesting because Dina called up their mother and said, can you come down to the studio? And um, they didn't know who I was. You know, if they went on the website, they would see I do nothing but nudes. <clears throat> so um, they show up, three of them, gorgeous young, you know, probably 17, 18. And the mother came with him. And it reminded me so much of, <laughs> of Degas, because in a lot of his paintings, you see the, the ballerina, and then there's this woman sitting there like this, you know, <laughs> with her arms <laughs> crossed, you know. So. Yeah. But, well, earlier we were talking about dark rooms, and I think Jeff has some photos of, of the dark room at your place of Edwards that he wants to show so people can see what it looks like there. Yeah. So, I don't like him. Go for it. Yeah, I am getting there. <clears throat> I'm on a laptop, so I'm kind of uh, hamstrung a little bit, but I think <clears throat> we had the uh, uh, great honor of. Uh, visiting Kim and Gina and having lunch at uh, Wildcat Hill at a workshop with Karen Casillas and uh, Elizabeth Opelenik. And uh, there's the dining room. Right there, there it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, uh, you show you very proudly went and said, well, come on, take a look at, at Edward Stark room, which was just a little kind of narrow hallway. Um, and it's got you know, trays, and it's got the chemicals that maybe, well, <laughs> maybe uh, uh, your your uh, father or uncle or uh, uh, Edward actually. Uh, and you talked about the kind of the legacy of <clears throat> the printmaking. Uh, those could have been tongs that Edward used, right? Yeah, I mean, the printing frame is the same. The dodging tools are all his. They're all original. Uh, I tried to collect as much. When we first moved into Wildcat, this room was designated uh, for a washer and dryer. My cousin lived there. Uh, I took that out, moved it outside, and put the sink back. Uh, but yeah, the, the printing frame you can see down there is was his original frame, and then the dodging tools. So I tried to collect stuff from my dad and and the tri the trimmers the mounting press all those are original so um yeah it's 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 a special place i mean it really is well it's got memorabilia it's got old photos uh, yeah. which kind of was maybe uh the combining and finding and keeping and collecting and curating this stuff may have actually led to you actually creating the book growing up western yeah, I definitely had, you know, I wanted that relationship, you know, with my grandfather, even though I never, I'd never, only met him once. But I really got to, to know him working with my father on uh, the original negatives. That's my real connection to Edward was having that intimacy uh, with my dad and um, being able to, to work in the dark room with my dad printing from those original negatives um that and then to look at edward's lie you know living here at wildcat with his wife karis who was his uh uh one of his main models and and his wife same thing with me and gina gina is my wife she's she was my model um so there's a lot of connections there and I wanted to put that in the book. You know, Edward photographed his son. Uh, I photographed my son uh, when he was like three, three years old. Um, I, funny he little actually came to you when he has to be shot, right? Yeah, <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny little caveat was um, <clears throat> he uh, he would I would be photographing Gina down in the studio, and he would be sitting there with his Tonka toys playing, you know, and, and I finished uh, shooting his mom and I look back there and he's taking his shirt off and his clothes and says, is it my turn, dad? <laughs> 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 oh. 
So I did a whole series of, of uh, photographs of, of him when he was young, and he modeled for, for quite a while. Um, of course, you get to a certain age and that stops. <laughs> you know. But those stories I wanted, and you'll see it in the book, uh, compare his photographs of his son, Neil, and my photographs of Zach. Uh, I, I love that connection there. Um, Kim, I'm curious, you know, just kind of clearing my head with uh, the stories I hear so much where obviously there's people that shoot analog and continue the process all the way through to the dark room. And um, recently to one of my trips to our local camera store, it's Roberts, and they also sell a lot of used camera systems, mainly analog. They're saying their customers are coming back, giving them the film uh, after they've shot it, say develop the film and scan it and throw the negatives away, I don't want them. And huh. th then going into the, the negative routine, obviously. How, are, right. you, are you ever tempted? Do you ever scan your images in? Do you ever work into a digital workflow with any of your work sooner or later? Or? The only time I've done it, and I had this, there's a picture of Gina and uh, a gobby plant. And she's right in the center of the gobby plant. And it's shot an 8 by 10 Well, the negative sucks. <laughs> You know, it's got spots on it, and uh, it was, it was, uh, I underexposed it, so the background is sort of gray, and I can print it, but it's very difficult to print, uh, especially the agave plant, you know, you have to dodge around that or burn around it. So I said, well, what I'll do is I'll scan a print, a good print, go into Photoshop, clean it all up and then get a digital negative made. And there's a place down in LA that does this. And uh, they made an eight by 10 negative from this scan print and it's perfect. Hmm. I mean, no dodging, no burning. It's almost like cheating. <laughs> you, know, you just put it in the enlarger and it's done, you know? Wow. It, it's, it's weird. I did two prints that way. Um, yeah, it's, it is like cheating because I'm so used to working the print, not a lot, but you know, there's touching it, you know, in that this day, you just throw it in there and you can just do one after another and they're, they're all, you know, perfect. Uh, so that's the only time I've ever used it. And it, it's, it's weird. It's a, it's a real photographic process because I don't know how they do it, but it comes back. There's an emotion side and a regular side. Well, they so, just rewrite a new negative, but it's a negative, and so you're basically yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Now, when you well, when you back, when I was going to say back oh. in the old days before I kind of <clears throat> went completely digital, uh, my traditional way of working was to have the film scan, do the digital imaging in Photoshop, and then write it back out to film. Uh, and uh, you could still do a uh, analog to digital back to analog <clears throat> workflow these days you could print platinum or palladium by making the digital positive dan burkholder i know that uh, uh kevin knows dan dan burkholder uh, teaches workshops about making platinum uh, prints off of digital positives and that would be another way of going but go ahead kevin well I'm, I'm, <clears throat> the next question comes about as you're analog printing and you're printing these and you're doing dodging and burning you know, do you have a master print you've kept all your notes on so that you can go back and repeat those or do you just do it out of gut feeling no i always write down uh the you know the exposure the paper the grade the dodging on the negative sleep now it'll change yeah. but this gives me a starting point um and a lot of prints of course they're like like your children you've done them a lot uh, but it, what I like is they do change. You know, my mood changes. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen Pepper 30s printed super dark by Edward and then ones that are light. So that's another thing I love about the analog process is everyone is kind of different. Where with digital, as soon as you push the print button, they're all the same. Yeah, that's you know? a quantitative way of repeating it. Yeah, and, and, then, and I kind of like days of dancing. You dance yeah. around print, you know, as you're going to dodge and burn things, you're yeah. kind of choreographing your head so you can repeat the print for the next yeah. one. Yeah, no, and 
That's why I never try and change anything. I always use the same film, same developer, same paper, you know, um, mm -hmm. because it just there again, I love printing, but that's not my passion. My passion is the process of the photographer, you know, is doing the photograph, is making the image in my mind and in my heart um, and photographing, you know, I, uh, that's why the painting was such a, a different thing for me was that it really, it really changed my sort of idea of, of what an image could be. Um, you know, I'm a good printer. I've been doing it for a long time and I enjoy that. I enjoy the silver print. But Going back to the canvas print, though, can you share the name with the company in L.A. who did the negative for you? I can't. I should have written it down. I can't remember uh, what it is, no. what company. But, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, pretty amazing. I mean, yeah, if you come up with it, send it to me an email. And yeah. We'll post a link to oh, this. When we post the recording, we'll, we'll post it. In yeah, the we can add that to it. Yeah, because it, it, you know, for a four by five, I think it was a hundred and some odd dollars. Well worth it. <laughs> you know? well, yeah. Good. good to know there's resources yeah, again, like that out there. The book for people who may have come in late yeah. so they can get an idea of what it looks like here. All well, 348 pages of it. Well, and this looking, is, yeah, looking forward to the UPS man delivering that book. That's going to be good. Yeah. Uh, and that's, of course, Gina and, Birgit was mentioning that I grew those flowers and it took me two years to grow them. So there yeah, again, that's, again. A, that's a process of, you know, not just an instant shot with the camera, going out there and watering them, going out and fertilizing them, and then eventually cutting them down and working with Gina in the studio. Uh, so it's a long process, which I like. So you're involved with it just like life you you go through life well with my photography i'm going through it all the time you know excellent now one, know, last, uh, one, one last question because i'm curious about what you know looking back at my old dark rooms and uh, i've got photographs of them all but i had big speakers in my dark rooms so do you play a lot of music when you when you get into the dark room and print is, yeah. is that part of your your routine or are you a quiet yeah. contemplative guy I'm a quiet guy. <laughs> I don't, I, uh, no phones, no nothing in there. You know, um, I like I like that that quietness of of the dark room. You know, it's uh, hence the name, dark room. <laughs> I, I get it. I mean, it's it's funny though because a lot of us like music, and I used to just have my big speakers, my Marantz tuner in there, and you know, right. I go in there, I'd be listening to music and working all day, and you know, do the, yeah. the two of them combine together, you know? Yeah, I mean, I have listened to music, um, but I find now, uh, and I only spend a max of three hours in the dark room. That's it. Uh, you know, I don't need to spend any more time there. And, um, you know, there to me, it's a process. You go in, you get it done. My dark room, if you saw a picture of it, is it's a workplace. <laughs> it's yeah. nothing fancy, you know. <laughs> um it's where i go to make friends you know that's that's it so yeah what are you what are you hiding under those uh covers in the back look like dry mount presses or something maybe but you know uh behind me uh, yeah dry mount presses yeah okay ricky did you have a comment or a question you were trying to uh i posted the place in la oh that's good that's okay and Peter was asking you if you were you inspired by Diego Rivera paintings for the cover photo of Gina. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. He was uh when my grandfather was in Mexico, he was good friends with Diego and Orozco and uh, and all that gang. Um always loved that his paintings. Um uh so yeah, definitely inspired by him. And I tried I tried different versions of it. And, you know, these, the ones that I picked for the book um, represent something that I, I I like. But what really pissed me off, if you know, is paintings, the flowers are huge. And I, can't, I couldn't get that perspective because I was using real flowers, you know. But he, 
I love that the balance of between the model of his, in his painting and the size of the flowers. It was very frustrating because I couldn't I couldn't do that. I you know I couldn't get that relationship. Um, so I did the best I could with what I had. Cool. Anybody else have any questions? Well, Birgit, I don't see the link. Did you possibly? You know, it says it? here I I sent a direct message to um Ika's phone. Yeah, uh, yeah trying to, to pull, go where it says to, and then use the little carrot there and make sure everyone is selected. There you go. Direct message. That's a Jeff Shiwi direct message. Everyone, I see. Yeah. Okay. So go yeah. select everyone. I want to know. <laughs> Sorry. There, there it is. We got it. Okay. Bye. Save the day. Yep. <laughs> Bye well, Kim, what's coming up next for you? Uh, oh, I'm okay. going to be doing with our friend uh, Azita uh, online um, critiquing, where uh, she's going to set it up. She's she's a great photographer, uh, being one of my students for a long time. And um, she really likes how I critique work. And so she's going to make that possible for me. So it'll probably be like 12 people, uh, probably a six-week class. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that, see how it's going to work out. And, you know, it would be very similar to what we're doing here, but it would just be uh, critiquing people's work. Cool. Yeah. You are really good at that, Kim. Yeah, <laughs> you really are. Yeah. I mean, you know things I I don't even know about myself <laughs> with my book. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I I, I want to know about that. Uh, and and what do you want me to bring you from Germany? Oh, those little bottles of fix them up stuff that you drink after dinner. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Underberg. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Also, we're doing actually tomorrow we start our workshop here at Wildcat, um, last one of the year. So I got to get in there and start cooking and cleaning up. <laughs> we'll be doing them next year too. And next year we'll also be doing two here at at, uh, at Wildcat. Excellent. Yeah, I recommend the workshops. As I said, I've done five of them over the past seventeen years. <laughs> and it's like nothing else that I've shot. They're very different. Um, I'm primarily a studio photographer, uh, lightings, strobes, and, and the like. And to go out there in the California sun of Carmel and Big Sur, it's yeah. pretty amazing. Oh, God, that sounds like a good time. As somebody somebody that gives a lot of workshops, I think I might have to look into that. I'd love to be part of a workshop for once. Yeah, we did that once, but I always wanted to meet Jock Sturgis. So Gina and I took a workshop with him uh, out in um, Palm, Palm Springs. So that was interesting. It's, it's fun to take workshops from other people, I think, you know, because sure. you sort of get an idea of different styles of teaching, uh, which I, I like. So excellent. When, when do next year's workshops go on your website? You know? Pretty soon. Pretty soon, Zach will put them up. Yeah, it's always it's always in April. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Gina. Hi, Gina. Hi. <laughs> uh, always the second or third, uh, first or second uh, weekend in April, and then always maybe let's see in September. So we have one always in April, September, maybe something in between. Cool. So, yeah, it's usually around my birthday in September. It was always my birthday present to myself to come out to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We usually put them up. I'll have to work out the dates with my son Zach, and uh, we'll put them up soon. Great. I hope you can join us. I'll try to share them on my website too, so people can do part of that. That's cool. Hey. All right. Well, we we certainly had a Thank heck of a good time team. at this point. Um, if there are no more questions, we'll stop the recording, and we can stay online for a few more minutes and um, have some chit chats. But uh, I am going to stop the recording. But before I do that. Um, Kim and everyone, I want to thank you all for being part of the photo chats today. Um, very energetic, very exciting, um, very motivating. Uh, I've already uh, gone to your site and got the, the book, uh, <laughs> the, the page for the book up, so I will order that 
uh, in a few minutes. Thank so you. look look for some orders. There'll be an influx of orders coming in. You won't be able to handle the flow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I look, for, look forward to putting that on my my collection, my coffee table. As Jeff knows, he's been here many times. It's, I have one room dedicated to that and you know some of the finest books I, I like that go on my big coffee table. So yeah. I'm sure that'll oh, have a place there. Definitely needs a sturdy table. <laughs> oh, it's a sturdy table. Let me tell you, it's a bomb shelter if there's ever something going on here. Right. You can use it to flatten your prints. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. That sounds like a good idea. But anyway, it was a real pleasure meeting you, Kim. And, and thank you so much for uh, spending the, the time with us today and being so candid and, and honest. And um, it opened up a lot of new thoughts and ideas. And uh, I really will try to look at taking one of your workshops sometime soon. And um, I, I hope that someday I get to meet you in person. I hope so, too. <laughs>